All right. So we've talked about the polarity. We've talked about the limb leads. Now we're actually going to look at the steps to um, to interpret a EKG lead or an EKG strip. This information is coming out of your um, your Beasley workbook because they do a lot better job of explaining it than the JB Learning book does. Um, so your um, this is actually coming from Chapter Six. So your general rules for EKG interpretation, um, you've got a five-step rule once we actually get on the strip. But your number one rule is what I said earlier. You treat the what, not the what? Treat the patient, not the monitor. So we're in America, so we're going to read everything from the left to the right. All right? Avoid shortcuts and assumptions. Once you get proficient in reading, these EKG strips, once you get out in the field, you should be able to look at the monitor and at least get somewhat of an idea of what's going on. That's not always the case. There have been several times where I just couldn't figure out what it was, and I actually had to get the doctor to look at it. I mean, and putting the basic rules to it is kind of what I thought it was, but not everything always looks the same, all right? Sometimes you have... Um, FLBs, when you look at strips, the medical term dates back to Eindhoven days, funky little beats. Sometimes there's these, it's not really a medical term, um, sometimes there's these little things that just show up that you just really don't know. But in order to interpret a strip, you're going to need to look at a, at a five-step um, systematic approach. You need to be able to master the accepted parameters of ECG interpretation. You will master that in this class, all right? Because for the next four or five weeks, for this class, you're going to live, breathe rhythm strips. Rhythm strips you're not going to get the very first time you look at it. But if you have a good understanding of the A and P of the heart and a good understanding of when the electrical current goes to the heart and where it correlates with your ECG rhythm, you will be able to identify where the anomalies are. Now you may not always be able to point it out right off, but you can look at something and say, hey, I think there's something wrong with the atrial depolarization, or I think there's something wrong with the uh, ventricular depolarization, or I think there's something wrong with ventricular repolarization. All right? So, write this down, study it, highlight it, note it. These are the steps that you're going to do for every rhythm strip in this class. First off, we're going to look at the heart rate. Second, we're going to look at the rhythm. Is it regular? Is it irregular? Is it regularly irregular? Or is it irregularly irregular? All right. Then we're going to look at the P wave. P wave is what? Atrial depolarization. Then we're going to look at the PRI. PRI is what? The start of the P wave to what? Start of ventricular depolarization, right? So right there at that junction at the Q. That's your PRI. All right? We're going to look at the length of the P wave and the PRI interval because that's going to tell us if we're actually having good conduction from the atria into the ventricles. Then we're going to look at the QRS complex. And looking at the QRS complex is going to tell us what? How good the ventricles are depolarizing or how good they are contracting. 
Did everybody get that wrote down? So our heart rate, that's just going to be the number of impulses that go through the heart in one minute. So using, um, using the rules, we're going to look at rate. Now, do you think the A rate and the V rate are always going to be the same? Yeah. In a normal heart they would be, but if we've got a dysrhythmia, if we've got some type of atrial dysrhythmia, we may have an atrial rate of, you know, 200 and a ventricular rate of 70. Or we may have a ventricular rate of 160 and no atrial rate. Alright? So initially, you need to look at the atrial rate and the ventricle rate. So how would we count the atrial rate? The P wave. So how would we count the ventricular rate? The QRS. Now, under a normal heart, why is it acceptable to count the QRS? Because that's your perfusing part of the heart contraction, right? You can have an atrial rate all day long, but if those ventricles aren't kicking out that cardiac output, it doesn't matter, right? So under a normal heart um, conduction system, it's acceptable to count the QRS. When we start getting those abnormalities, we don't need to do that. Intrinsic rate of the SA node is 60 to 100. Y'all know that. These terms right here, elementary. Bradycardia less than 60, tachycardia greater than 100. Heart rate determination. There's two methods that they talk about. The first is the six second, six second method. So, if you take your rhythm strip that I gave you, find three of those small little tick marks on the bottom. Kind of take your pen and highlight those. From the start of the first tick mark to the third tick mark, that's a six second strip. So how are we going to get heart rate using the six second strip method? Yeah. So I'm going to count the QRS complexes that are occurring in that six second time period and multiply it by ten. There's 60 seconds in a minute. That's why we can use six seconds and multiply by ten. So the most basic, easiest part of rhythm interpretation will be finding your rate. One, two, three. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So what's my rate? Eight. 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 All right. The second method is your R to R interval method. Now this will be used to get a little bit more of a precise um, heart rate. Here's the problem with the R to R method. You've got an irregular rate, an irregular rhythm. You may not always get the same distance between an R and an R to actually be able to get a good counting rate. So in that case, you may have to use a six second method and, or you may have to sit there and count for a whole minute, okay? You don't want to take shortcuts on. Um, you don't want to take shortcuts on your patient. All right. Now, when we're using, when we're just looking at a strip, if you've got an irregular rhythm on your strip, you're going to use the six-second method because that's the best you got to go with, right? So your R to R is your most accurate if your heart rate's regular. And again, it's an estimation of the heart rate. So what you'll do is you'll look at the QRS complex that falls on a heavy line. All right, so if you look at your pink paper, you've got real thick, heavy lines that, are, that make the outside of the uh, .20 boxes. 
So you'll look at one um, vertical line right there. If the QRS falls on that line, that's the one that you're going to use. Okay? And you'll see that in just a minute. Then you count the number of large boxes between this and the R wave on, and the next R wave. Between the R wave that falls on the heavy line and the next R wave. Then we're going to divide it by 300. What? Huh? Into 300 or by 300? It should be by, no, it should be into 300. Alright? So this is how we would do it. Um, let's see. For y'all's first example, they could have used a little better one. Alright, so we're going to say this one falls on the closest of that thick line. Do y'all see that? This is my thick line. It's not a straight line, but so it falls the closest. So that would be one, two, three, four. We're going to just go ahead and say four there. So 300 divided by 4 would be what? 75. So using the R to R method, our heart rate is roughly 75. Does that make sense? Now, let's just go with those two for right now. I don't want to get into the others. All right, so rate, pretty easy. Six-second method or your R to R, all right? Rhythm. What are we looking for? Just our is our heart rate beating in a normal rhythmic sequence, right? One, two, three, four, five. Or is it irregular? One, one, two, three, three, four, four, five. All right. Is it just beating normal? Or has it got its little extra beats in it? Okay. Is it just irregular? So, a regular pattern. The interval between the R waves is going to be normal. We'll see that on sinus rhythms, sinus bradycardias, um, sinus tachycardias. You're going to just have a normal impulse, a normal time of impulse between your R waves. Okay? An irregular pattern is going to be where you don't have a normal uh, point of impulse or a normal impulse between the two. <coughs> I'm going to, um, I'll put up all these PowerPoints on Canvas for you guys, too. Just haven't had time to do an outline on these. All right. So, we're going to measure the regularity between the P waves or the R waves, all right? So, this is where you would actually start using your calipers. This, they're not going to be big enough, but this is where I'm going to put my calipers on my QRS and my next QRS. Then I'm going to take it and see if it's regular, if it's the same distance in between. Stop it. All right? Does that make sense? Or I'm going to do it on my P wave. I'm just going to take it and turn it and just make sure it's regular. You don't have to turn it. You can just take it. And make sure the distance is the same in between each one. Okay? Alright? So, the way that you determine it technically um, is as if the intervals vary <coughs> by less than 0 0.06 seconds or 1.5 small boxes, we can consider the rhythm to be regular. 
all right? So sometimes you may have a little bit of a variation that just makes up just one of these little boxes, but we're not we're talking about a big irregularity, at least two of the boxes, okay? Does that make sense? Um, if they're greater than 0 0.0 seconds, the rhythm is considered irregular. So you've got a regularly irregular. These are going to be irregular rhythms that occur in a pattern. So I think of an example of this. A regularly irregular rhythm. Not a fib. It's got a predictable pattern. How about a Bigemini QRS or a Bigemini PVC? All right, that's new terms, but PVCs. So you've got a heartbeat and a PVC, a heartbeat, a PVC, heartbeat, PVC. All right, that's going to be a regularly irregular pattern because the irregularity shows up in a predictable manner. All right, I know that that heart rate is going to be irregular, but I know what the irregularity is going to be. Does that make sense? Then you've got occasionally irregular where the intervals of only one or two are, are uneven. So every now and then you may have some premature impulses and it may fire off a QRS. But then it goes back to its normal rhythm. Okay? That, you may see that with premature atrial contractions. Or sometimes you may see it with the occasional PVC. Okay? Make sense? And then irregularly irregular. This is where AFib's gonna fall in. Because AFib, the atria is fibrillating in a way that we can't predict. So that irregular pattern on the monitor is not going to be predicted. Okay? What would Try Yeah. Most of the time. Most of the time with those PVCs, they're, ouch. Yeah. they're going to be predictable if you see them more than once, like if you see them in a pattern. All right? Does that make sense? Regularly irregular, occasionally irregular, and irregularly irregular. Or predictable irregularities and unpredictable irregularities. Got it? Alright, I know it's kind of hard to see, <coughs> but using our rules that we just learned, our first rule is going to be what? Heart rate. Alright, so this is a six second strip, one, two, three, four, five, six. What's my rate? Okay. Using the six second. So let's use the um, R to R. Mm, we don't really have one that's right on the ball. So we can actually use this one because it's one little box off the line and this one's one little box off the line. All right. So. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. Yeah, we'll just say five. 300 divided by five. Six. All right. So our second rule. Regularity. All right. So... I'm going to put my calipers on it, and I'm going to look. Is it regular? So it is just a regular. Rhythm. Um, yeah, you could count the boxes in between each, each one of them and tell that it was regular. But that's going to take a lot more time than using the calipers. All right. 
That's simple enough, right? All right. Do it again. Look at this. Our rate is 80. Using the um, the R to R, I'm probably going to go with this one. It's the closest to it. So one, two, three, four, and they kind of have about the same distance. So we'll say four. 300 divided by 4. It may be different. But is there a huge difference in a heart rate of 75 and a heart rate of 80? No. Alright. Your R to R is going to give you a little bit more of a precise measurement. Alright. So, using our second rule. Took my calipers and looked at the regularity. Regular or irregular? So it's a regular rhythm. Make sense? So now we're going to look at the P wave. Y'all good with the lights off? Y'all want me to turn them back on? Down. So the P wave is produced when the right and left atria depolarize. Y'all heard that, heard that, heard that. So it should be your first deviation from the isoelectric line, right? <coughs> should it be positive or negative? Positive. It should be rounded and upright. We will describe our P wave when we actually do our, our rhythm. We're looking for a regular rhythm of the P wave because we want our SA node to fire at a regular rate. So if we have a regular rhythm, or if we, any rhythm, if we have a rhythm that has a good P wave, that we have a P wave for each QRS, that can be considered a sinus rhythm. Even if it's not a normal sinus rhythm, it can still be considered a sinus rhythm because it incorporates the SA node, okay? That's why you can have sinus bradycardia or sinus tachycardia, right? Yes, Nick. Thanks. So this is what we're looking at on our P wave. Are the P waves present? That's the first thing before you can do anything else. You've got to be able to see the P wave, right? The next step, are they regular? Are they occurring regular? Step three is, is there a P wave present for each QRS and or is there a QRS for each P wave? We need a P wave QRS, P wave QRS, P wave QRS. Okay? Are they smooth, rounded, upright? Or are they inverted? And do all the P waves look similar? Because you could actually have sinus SA node issues to where it's not always firing with the same amplitude. Okay? Now it won't turn when I want it to. So P wave. First step. Are there P waves? Second step is what? Do we have a P wave? Are they regular? They occur in a regular interval? What was our third rule? Is there a P wave for every QRS? Fourth rule. I'd say they're rounded up, right? Fifth rule. Yeah. They all look the same. 
All right? So when we actually do our rhythm interpretations, these are just rules that you're going over in your head, okay? You're not going to write all those out, all right? What we would be looking for is present P for every Q rounded upright, all right? If you want to get in the habit just so that you remember to do it, to write it out, that's fine whenever you're doing your interpretation. <coughs> if you want to get in the habit of just writing out those five rules, that's fine whenever you go over it, okay? The PRI measures the time interval from the onset of atrial contraction to the onset of ventricular contraction, which occurs where? The AV node, all right? So, what do you think problems with the PRI is going to tell us? So, it's going to tell us problems with the SA node, problems with the firing, all right? So if we've got a prolonged SA node, um, but it's mainly going to tell us problems with the AV node, all right? Um, this is where you're going to see like your first degree heart blocks and things like that. What it's showing us is that we've got a block in the AV node. For whatever reason, the atrial contraction, the atrial depolarization isn't making its way all the way through the AV node or for some reason there's a delay in it going through the AV node, okay? So it's measured from the onset of the P to the onset of the QRS complex, okay? This is important. Your normal interval is 0.12 to 0.20. We don't want it greater than 0.20. If it's greater than 0.20, then that indicates a block, a heart block. So we're looking on the Squares, we're looking at three to five small squares, okay? If it's greater than one large block, then that's a anomaly. That's not right, okay? So, what to look at at your PRI? Is it greater than 0 0.20? How would we quickly determine if it's greater than 0 0.20? Is it bigger than one big box? One big box, right? Because one big box is made up of five small boxes. Or five what? Point. What is each small box? Okay. Yeah, I didn't hear you. 0.04 small box. All right. Then we're going to look at is it less than 0.12. So if it's a really short atrial contraction, that's not good either. All right or if it's allowing it to go through the AV node really quickly, that's not good because the AV node has to allow for ventricular filling. And then are the PRI intervals constant across the EKG strip? Do they have the same distance on each PRI interval? We will actually see changes um, in second degree, third degree heart blocks to where the PRI is different. All right, so looking at the PRI, this would be the start right there. This actually should be over just a little bit. And then this would be the end right there, okay? So I've got one, two, three, four small boxes. So it's right at what? Point one six, right? So our PRI. 0 0.16 milliseconds, all right? If we were to measure, would each PRI be about four small boxes? Yeah, it would, all right? So this is just a normal PRI interval. Yeah, I guess it doesn't matter where the Um, just into the PRI, I mean, it's where the Q wave starts. I don't know that there's an exact name for it. Yeah. All right, so now looking at the QRS complex, we know what it represents. It's depolarization of the ventricles, right? 
So your Q wave is your first downward deflection. Then your R wave is your first upward or positive deflection. And then your S wave is sharp down, and then it should go back to isoelectric line, right? Um, you don't want a real you don't want a real deep inverted Q wave, all right? You don't want a real deep inverted Q wave. You want it to be, if, it, if there is negative deflection, sometimes there's not even a negative deflection on a Q wave. But if it is, we don't want it to be a whole lot, okay? The QRS should not be any greater than 0 0.12 seconds. If it is, that is considered a wide QRS complex. And then if it gets real small, like the 0.08 seconds into that area, we're, that is considered a narrow complex. Okay? Does that make sense? If they're less than 0 0.2, are they all similar in appearance and across, across the EKG strip? So we're just looking at the regularity. Are they all about the same across the EKG strip? Make sense? Everybody got this right now? Um, well, bundle branch block isn't just going to be the um, interval of the QRS. Um, I mean, I don't really have a great way to answer that because with a bundle branch block, you're looking more at the complex shape and the, you know, um, like position of where the block is on the QRS. Is it a right or left bundle branch block? So you may not always have a wide. Um, QRS. I don't know how else to answer that. Alright, so looking at our QRS, we're going to start at the Q, end back at the S where it starts going to the, going back up, and it's going to be 1, 2, roughly about 2, so it's going to be like a .08. All right, looking at the QRS, they all look about the same. They're all regular. They're all normal, right? So that would be considered very complex. Well, anything below 0 0.212, I kind of said it wrong. Anything below 0 0.12 is an narrow complex, but that's not a bad thing until you get into your tachycardia. Um, and then narrow com complex or wide complex tachycardia is it would depend on your management or your management will depend on whether it's narrow or wide. And then your ST. Your ST is going to be, it's going to, um, it's going to begin at the end of the QRS complex and ends with the onset of the T wave, all right? Um, it's characterized by that J point that we talked about just a minute ago. This is what we're going to be looking at, especially if we're suspecting MI when we do a 12 lead. Are we looking for ST elevation or ST depression? So we, well, I would say you're going to look for both of them. But it may look like this or it may look like this. All right. So ST elevation is going to indicate ischemia. And ST depression is going to indicate injury, old injury, all right? Now, that's not always the case, but in most times, you would have a um, depressed ST segment if somebody's had an old injury, okay? And then the T wave produced by ventricular con uh, relaxation and is commonly seen as the first upward positive deflection following the QRS. So when we read the rhythm, we're not, we're really looking at the P, the QRS, and then the ST segment, 
okay? <coughs> then there's a U wave that's usually not visual, visible on the EKG, but sometimes it could show up as a wave that follows the T wave. Um, don't really have a lot to say about the U wave other than if you see something after a T wave and it doesn't really look like a P wave, it doesn't look like the other P waves, it may very well be a U wave. Does that indicate high potassium? Um, usually your high potassium, low potassium. Low potassium. the U wave may show that, but usually when you have um, potassium issues, um, you're going to have um, tall spike T waves or depressed T waves. Then artifact, we talked about that a little earlier. That's just going to be those ugly little lines on your rhythm that's not coming from your patient. Could be caused by patient movement, um, looser defective electrodes. That's why you got to make sure they're good and secure. Improper grounding. The 60 cycle, that can be any of the ambulances, electrical interference, or faulty EKG apparatus. Again, this is going to be a situation where you're going to treat the patient, not the monitor, okay? Um, most of the time, your artifact is going to show up on your baseline, all right? One of the ways that I know that this is an AFib is the fact that it's a regular rhythm, okay? So, if you've got a regular rhythm and it's just looking like all that junk, you need to maybe just stop the ambulance for a minute or either get a good recording when you get to the hospital when nothing's moving and the patient's holding still, okay? 